Item Number SCP-131 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures No special safety procedures are to be taken with SCP-131-A and SCP-131-B. They are free to travel about Site-19, so long as they do not attempt to enter any restricted areas or attempt to leave the facility. Casual contact with the subjects is permitted, but it is recommended that such contact be kept to a minimum to prevent the creatures from forming an attachment to personnel. Hourly tabs are to be kept on subjects at all times. Failure to account for their presence at these times constitutes a level 1 lockdown situation. Any report of abuse or mistreatment of the subjects will result in a harsh reprimand. Description SCP-131-A and SCP-131-B, affectionately nicknamed the iPods by personnel, are a pair of teardrop-shaped creatures, roughly 30 centimeters or 1 foot in height, with a single blue eye in the middle of their bodies. SCP-131-A is burnt orange in color, while SCP-131-B is mustard yellow. At the base of each creature is a wheel-like protrusion which allows for locomotion, suggesting that the creatures may be biomechanical in origin. The subjects can move surprisingly fast, covering over 60 meters, or 200 feet, in a matter of seconds. The subjects, however, lack a braking system, which has led to some rather spectacular, if not overly amusing, mishaps involving the creatures. The subjects have also shown the ability to climb sheer surfaces, and have gotten lost in the air vents on more than one occasion. The subjects seem to have the intelligence of common house cats, and are insatiably curious. Most of the time they simply roll around the facility, observing personnel at work and catching peeks at other safe class SCPs. The subjects seem to be able to communicate with each other via an untranslatable high-pitched babbling. The subjects have never been observed to blink, even in laboratories when the subjects have been videotaped for over 18 consecutive hours. The subjects seem to respond well to any affection given to them, and will quickly bond to the giver of said affection, much in the same way a puppy bonds with a human being. They will follow anyone or anything they've made a bond with anywhere, even into normally restricted areas. Although curious, the subjects can sense danger in their general vicinity, and if the object of their bond begins to approach something they register as dangerous, for example Euclid or Keter-class objects, they will swarm around their bonded companion's feet, or appropriate extremities, while babbling in a panicked tone, as if to warn them. Because of the daily dangers faced by Site-19 staff in dealing with Euclid and Keter-class objects, it is recommended that staff avoid making attempts to bond with the subjects, as it can pose a distraction during delicate operations and experiments, and may pose a danger to the subjects themselves. If the subjects are ignored by their bonded target long enough, they will eventually lose interest and return to their normal activities. It should be noted that the subjects require no real care or maintenance from the site staff. They do not eat, leave droppings, or even sleep. It would seem that the only sustenance they require is visual stimulation, although this requires further study to verify. Subjects SCP-131-A and SCP-131-B were found in a cornfield outside in the year 19... They were promptly transported to Site-19 via data expunged, and were then downgraded to Safe Class, and given free reign across the site once it became clear they were not broadcasting what they saw to any hostile foreign powers. Addendum 131-1 During an incident that took place on the subjects followed one of the cleaning staff on routine cleaning of the container of SCP-173. After their normal attempts to warn the cleaner of the danger were ignored, the creatures rushed into the container in front of him and the other two personnel on duty. Once inside, the staff members observed the subjects sitting in front of SCP-173 and watching it intently, as if aware that it could only move if unobserved. The cleaners ignored the presence of the subjects and continued with the bi-weekly cleaning, as per standard procedures. When the cleaning crew left, the subjects did as well, rolling backwards slowly and never taking their eyes off of SCP-173. Current applications of SCP-131-A and SCP-131-B as wardens for SCP-173, and perhaps other SCP which require constant observation, such as SCP-689, are being considered. Item Number SCP-378 Object Class Thaumiel Notice from the Foundation Records and Information Security Administration 
Following the implementation of the Kraken Protocol on 2706-1963, containment procedures for SCP-378 have been updated. Personnel assigned to the SCP-378 project are to review its updated documentation as soon as possible. Claudia Southey, Director, RISA. Special Containment Procedures SCP-378 is to be contained in a subterranean entity containment terrarium. Temperature and humidity are to be maintained at levels optimal for the growth and habitation of Heterodermia cane crow, Utica cave lichen, and Prenolepis everettman, North American cave ant. Twice per year, SCP-378 is to undergo a medical and psychological examination. Access to SCP-378's containment terrarium is separated from the surrounding facility by a decontamination chamber. Handling personnel are required to wear full body protection and must be screened for SCP-378-A prior to exiting decontamination. Infected personnel are to be terminated unless the position of SCP-378-1 or 3 is vacant, in which case they are to be assigned to the relevant position instead. As of the adoption of the Kraken Protocol, SCP-378's containment is focused on maintaining its three primary containment components. SCP-378-1 is housed in the Area 19 barracks. SCP-378-1 is employed as a maintenance technician with a security clearance of O-A-19. Upon the death of the current SCP-378-1, brain-dead or comatose reserve personnel may be elected to replace it. As SCP-378-1 is the primary means of communication with SCP-378, care must be maintained to keep SCP-378-1's vocal functions in working order. SCP-378-2 currently takes the form of David Lockheed, a 36-year-old Caucasian male and the employee of the American Supernatural Containment Initiative, ASCII, as a clerical aide, to maintain the continued operations of the SCP Foundation in the United States. SCP-3782 has been tasked with sabotaging ASCII operations against the Foundation, as well as collecting information in the Foundation's interests. SCP-3782 is expected to follow a strict health and exercise regimen due to the inherent difficulty in replacing it. SCP-3783 currently takes the form of Lisa Martin, a 33-year-old Mexican-American female employee at the Spicy Crust Pizza in Staten Island. In the event of SCP-3783's death, it must be replaced as soon as possible. Each component is fitted with a tracking device and an audio recorder. Each week, embedded agents stationed near each component are to evaluate the health and integrity of each component and its associated surveillance equipment. The utilization of SCP-378-A in further infiltration is pending Foundation Overwatch approval. Description. SCP-378 is an arthropod, superficially resembling a deformed larval instance of Scolopendra gigantea, the Amazonian giant centipede. SCP-378's legs are largely vestigial, primarily meant to assist in peristaltic locomotion. SCP-378 measures 3 meters from mouth to anus, with a bodily thickness of 1 meter and a weight of 233 kilograms. Under normal conditions, SCP-378 is an omnivore, with a diet consisting primarily of lichen and insects. SCP-378 is capable of asexual reproduction at will, producing instances of SCP-378-A from its anus. Instances of SCP-378-A resemble adult Scolopendra gigantea. Dissection suggests this resemblance is superficial as SCP-378-A lack expected organ systems beyond a primitive neural network. Instances of SCP-378-A are controlled remotely by SCP-378. SCP-378-A are obligate endoparasites, infecting advanced primates such as humans, Homo ignotus, Data expunged, and Gigantopithecus sapiens, common Sasquatch. Upon infection, SCP-378-A integrates itself with its host's nervous system through poorly understood means, inducing brain death and extending SCP-378's remote control to the host itself. Vital functions and sensory input remain unaffected. Upon infecting a suitable host, SCP-378 will attempt to reintegrate its hosts into their respective species' social sphere. Once integrated, 
SCP-378 directs its hosts to indefinitely engage in the behaviors typical for its species, such as communal labor and social recreation. Human hosts prefer environments with a high population density and a robust entertainment scene. The upper limit of active hosts SCP-378 can maintain at any one time is unknown. Upon initial interrogation, SCP-378 confessed to the existence of 26 human hosts, as well as two instances of Alouada Pigra, Guatemalan Black Howler, and three instances of SCP-1000, of which it noted had been acquired during a period of heavy intoxication. Addendum 178-294-B a Psychological Evaluation of SCP-378 Conducted by Dr. Simon Glass Tentatively designated Scolopendra Animalia, SCP-378 is unique among arthropods, possessing either human levels of sapience or the ability to emulate its host's intellectual faculties. In any case, SCP-378 is self-aware and remarkably intelligent. SCP-378's relationship to its hosts is complicated. While SCP-378 maintains a consistent sense of identity across multiple hosts, each is treated as a persona for SCP-378 to roleplay. Hosts rarely interact with SCP-378 or fellow hosts, suggesting SCP-378 primarily utilizes its anomalous abilities for entertainment. This is further suggested by SCP-378's readiness to abandon such personas under duress. Aside from integration into human social spheres, host behavior is largely unique to each instance. Extroversion is relatively common. Hosts rarely isolate themselves except to sleep or excrete. SCP-378 appears to take equal enthusiasm in stressful versus pleasant situations. Of note. SCP-378 is particularly attached to the identity of Lisa Martin. In contrast to other hosts, Lisa Martin's weekly routine is relatively static. From 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. on all days except Saturday, Miss Martin will show up to work at the nearest pizzeria from the former location of Digian Antonio's Pies, regardless of employment status or scheduled hours. From 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. on all days except Saturday, Miss Martin will engage in the maintenance of one of 17 rooftop gardens across the city of New York. Of these, 13 are maintained by a cooperative, 12 of which Miss Martin is not a part of. From 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. on Saturdays, Miss Martin alternates between socializing with a collection of friends, co workers, and lovers, and playing piano for various high end bars. From 11 p.m. to 12 a.m., Miss Martin will shower and prepare for bed. Miss Martin will sleep from 12 a.m. to 7 a.m. when she will wake up and prepare for the next cycle. In the event of Miss Martin's death, SCP-378 will direct another host to assume her identity. Attempts to interrupt Miss Martin's routine have been unilaterally met with unusual levels of hostility from SCP-378 and its hosts. From Assistant Director Daniela Hayden, Classification Level Rise of 4, Employee number 134. 2. Director Kelsey Feinstein, classification level XK4. Employee number 87. Regarding, 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 identifying current hosts. Date 2704, 1963. Director Feinstein. Mr. Song and Dr. Glass's work have revealed quite a bit about SCP 378. Most importantly, I do not believe it understands the significance of social dynamics, especially in regards to hierarchy and social capital. Several of SCP-378's identities held surprising positions of power. Indeed, two of them, David Lockheed and Alfonso Liaz, are beyond reach of the Foundation's current capacity to contain. Despite this, SCP-378 has shown a willingness to sacrifice such hosts in order to defend replace, or otherwise maintain Lisa Martin. Odd, yes, but useful enough. It'd be a shame if something were to happen to Miss Martin and her friends, would it not? SCP-378 is sapient, but it by no means understands the significance of its actions. With a little bit of persuasion, David Lockheed might yet ascend from petty paper pusher for the ASCII, right where the Foundation most needs a puppet. 
And, if I'm not mistaken, spicy crust pizza can always do with a second franchise. Proposal Employing SCP-378's anomalous abilities to defend Foundation operations in the United States. Council votes summary. Approved. Proposal accepted. The Kraken Protocol has been initiated. From Senior Researcher Sang Hun Song, Classification Level Gamma U3, Employee Number 148. Two, Director Kelsey Feinstein, Classification Level XK4, Employee Number 87. Regarding Delays in the Gamma U2677 Project. Date 2107. 1965. So, good news and bad news, Director. Good news, as I'm assuming you already heard. With the plans for construction of Site-56, all thanks to a certain Mr. Lockheed, the Kraken Protocol's getting a much-needed expansion. With its relative proximity to both the Lily of the Valley Nexus and the Pacific Northwest, it's a perfect opportunity to expand the scope of SCP-1000's containment while ensuring the ASCII doesn't suck LOTV dry before we get to it. For all its oddities, SCP-378 appears to be delighted at the prospect of a change in scenery. I can't imagine a tropical centipede grub likes having a sphere of influence limited to New England of all places, but that's besides the point. Its A was compliant enough on the way there. Which leads me to the bad news. Rupert Tremont's a fun little guy. Agent of the FBI's unofficial, unusual incidents unit, and all too stupid to trust Agent Ryans with his drink while he went to the restroom. After that, it's a matter of transport back to Provisional Area 56 in Black Rock, and a centipede down the gullet. Problem comes up when 378 tells us it can't establish a connection. Now, Tremont's still alive, so that's not normal. We run a number of tests, try to figure out what went wrong. And that's when we see a different centipede in his head, where our centipede usually goes. More to come, but I have a bad feeling about this. Item number, SCP-481. Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-481 is currently contained in Sector 25, in a specially designed dormitory for the affected subjects. The dormitory is built to modify D-Class specifications, with space for two occupants at this point, based on the spread of the scar tissue. Besides the standard sleeping quarters, there is a living space for each accessible through an outer isolation room. Subjects are allowed written and recorded entertainment that is available from local sources and does not violate containment procedures. No excessive funds are to be spent on this. Subjects are allowed visits to the outer facility and external walled gardens for no more than three hours per day, supervised by two Level 2 security personnel. Cameras are installed in the dormitories, and are to be monitored by one Level 2 security personnel at all times. Subjects should not be prevented from self-harm, except for in cases of corresponding large-scale violence and full-body restraints are authorized in this case under the supervision of a trained medical team. Description SCP-481 was originally a clustered pattern of scars, roughly corresponding to a variably partial map of location expunged, India, appearing on SCP-481-1, formerly Mrs. since at least 1990. SCP-481 has since spread to SCP-481-2, formerly a Foundation agent. When SCP-481 first manifested on SCP-481-1, it appeared as a small series of crisscrossing scars that has been found to correspond to the neighborhood of location expunged. While it is still not readily apparent why this town is being mapped, the sympathetic effects of the scars in city are readily apparent. The scars are a perfect recreation of the town. Streets and alleys appear as straight scars resembling lacerations made with a dull cutting instrument. Buildings are represented by scar nodes. A small canal flowing through the town is represented as a jagged scar across the abdomen of SCP-4811. The growth of new scars corresponds to the expansion of the already overcrowded town and city, including slums set up on unofficial roads. 
Described as very painful by both SCP-4811 and 2, the effect is not limited to growth. Any demolition leads to a severely painful scouring of the corresponding scar patterns. Scars currently cover 100% of the skin, including the scalp, of SCP-4811, and approximately 47% of the skin of SCP-4812, from the shoulders to the lower torso, including both arms. SCP-4811 has shown tendencies to self-harm since her incarceration. Any scars left by this faded completely within 20 days, and did not correspond to changes in the city architecture. It was therefore believed that the self-inflicted scars were merely an expression of SCP-4811's frustration with her containment. This has since been proven inaccurate by Incident 48111. Addendum 4811. When SCP-4811 ran out of skin for the scars to expand to, it was believed that the expansion events were over. Within a week, scars began appearing on SCP-4812. He was immediately quarantined along with SCP-4811 and has since been under observation. SCP-4812 had a history of dealings with the data expunged before coming to the Foundation just as SCP-4811 did. Whether this connection is the key to SCP-4812 becoming the new focus for the SCARS is currently under investigation. Incident 48111 On date expunged, SCP-4811 attempted suicide via an improvised plastic blade drawn across the wrists. At the same time, the now infamous riots in location expunged, India, had reached the peak of their violence. SCP-4811 was immediately attended to and stabilized, while the riots lasted for several days. The source of the riots was later traced to two neighborhoods, corresponding with the parts of the scar pattern covering SCP-4811's wrists. Addendum 4812 Further investigation led to similar ongoing reports of violence and petty crime from neighborhoods mapped out on the portions of the body associated with repeated self-harm. Tests were performed to determine whether damage to the scar pattern caused corresponding violence and surgeons made several incisions to parts of the scars corresponding with business district. No effect was noted. It is hypothesized that the self-inflicted damage is a compulsory response to violence and other crime in the city. Self-harm appears to be inflicted on parts of the body associated with high-crime neighborhoods. On date expunged, after SCP-4812 attempted to remove a portion of his upper arm during a string of murders in the corresponding neighborhood, current procedures involving full-body restraints were adopted. SCP-4811 Test Log Research Personnel Dr. Research Assistant Hayden Mobile Task Force 481 MTF-481, D-5999, recruited locally. These tests take place between 1103-2000 and 1107-2000. MTF-481, Rabble Rousers, specifically assembled for these tests based on skills in causing public unrest, traveled to location expunged, India, to better understand what SCP-481-1 is reacting to when she self-harms. A total of five escalating tests are scheduled. SCP-4811 is to be observed via CC to gauge her response. Test 1 Preconditions None Action An elaborate and carefully choreographed fight was staged between 12 locally hired stuntmen. Test Result SCP-4811 did not deviate in any way from her normal routine. Notes as suspected, mere overtures of violence are not sufficient to trigger a response. Dr. Test 2 Preconditions None Action Actual fights were instigated between researchers and locals in a very close area, leading to violence among at least 23 people. While there were no fatalities, several locals were injured due to their lack of formal training in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Test result. SCP-4811 began to scratch vigorously at her lower back, in the area of scars corresponding to the location of the fight, drawing a small amount of blood. Notes. Okay, 
I see no reason to instigate a full-scale riot. I think we get the picture. Doctor... Test 3. Preconditions. SCP-481-1 was fully restrained to determine what effect denying her compulsions had. Action. After arming a small group of local malcontents, MTF-481 obtained permission from the local authorities to deal with them. MTF-481 made quick work of the poorly trained force. Test result. SCP-481-1 became visibly uncomfortable and demanded several times to be allowed out of her restraints. Blood pressure was recorded as elevated, and EEGs showed a sharp increase in the amount of electrical activity in the brain. Notes. Is it the stress causing those reactions, or the violence? Dr. Test 4. Preconditions. SCP-4811 was fully restrained to determine what effect denying her compulsions had. Action. Mobile researcher proceeded to torture D-5999 with various implements, finishing with him after three hours. Test result. SCP-4811 shook violently for the entire three hours, before appearing to have a tonic-clonic seizure, followed by a cessation of her vitals. She was successfully revived. Notes. Very interesting. Her blood pressure was way up, her heart was arrhythmic, and her brain's electrical activity was still spiking after that. It appears that the scale of the violence is not so important as, to some degree, the brutality. Still, until we better understand what's so damn important about this city, we're not going to lose our only clue to heart failure. Testing is suspended. Dr. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.